Tram system's offline. Getting around is going to be difficult. That air seems to be flowing again. That's a start. What the hell was that? Automatic quarantine must have tripped when the filtration system restarted. Everybody relax. What was that? Did you hear that? I'm not sure. What the hell? I don't know. Something's in the room with us. It is said that Dead Space helped kickstart the comeback of the horror genre in the late 2000s. When you play this opening sequence and what comes next, you can see why. Dead Space truly made you feel afraid of what was lurking around the corner, using every opportunity to jump scare you into oblivion. My name is Nick, this is Deep Dives, and welcome to the world of Dead Space. For anyone new, Deep Dives is a series where I take an extended look right inside the guts of various video games, talking about facts, figures, some of the more obscure stuff behind the scenes, and anything I think might be interesting. Once again, by mere coincidence, I'm covering another horror game, so of course, if you don't like gore, it's probably best not to watch this video. Please remember, as I run through games, I try to do so in the confines of the release and any games that come prior. Things covered in future games that explain more about the lore, I will generally leave for other videos as to not repeat myself. Finally, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for your continued support of the channel. Every like, comment and sub means the world to me. Thank you so much. Right, let's get to it and talk about some dead space. Back in early 2006, Glenn Schofield and the folks over at EA Redwood Shores pitched the concept of Dead Space to their parent company, Electronic Arts. Having been seen as a studio for licensed game properties, EA Redwood were looking to branch out into original properties in a bid to establish themselves as, and I quote, a proper game studio. At the time, the project was known as Rancid Moon, and was inspired by the Silent Hill series, the Resident Evil series, and more importantly, Resident Evil 4, which came out two years prior. Expectations of success were low, but the team still wanted to prove themselves. With that, EA gave them three months to come up with a prototype. So they could meet the deadline, they decided to develop Dead Space on the original Xbox, and after 18 whole months, finally had the project greenlit by EA having seen a vertical slice build of the game equivalent to one level. In September 2007, EA announced the existence of Dead Space and the team at Redwood Shores built 11 more levels inside 10 months, reusing the game engine they had designed for The Godfather, one of the selling points being its use of the Havoc physics engine. On October 13th, 2008, Dead Space released in North America on Xbox 360 and PS3, with the PC version releasing a week later on the 20th of October. It then released in Australia on the 23rd of October, before finally releasing a day later in Europe on the 24th of October 2008. As mentioned previously, Dead Space takes a lot of inspiration from Resident Evil 4, with its over-the-shoulder view and action-oriented nature while still keeping in with the horror theme. The aim, however, was to make Dead Space more immersive and faster paced, so having to stop and shoot was out, and walking and gunning was in. The main way the immersion was showcased was the lack of HUD. The clever clogs over at Redwood come up with a fantastic solution to this, and that was to include normal HUD elements into the environment. Isaac's health bar, for instance, is on the back of his suit, along with his kinesis bar. 
Things like inventory space and the map are brought up in real time through a hollow display, meaning you are limited to the spaces you truly feel comfortable in while checking gear and objectives. In a similar way, audio and video logs play out as pop-ups from the suit, so there really is no space to view these without the constant fear of being attacked. A nice touch here is if you spin the camera around, everything can be seen in reverse. You really are looking through Isaac's eyes. Separating Dead Space from a myriad of shooters at the time was its strategic dismemberment system, meaning instead of just piling bullets into a creature's face, you are better off trying to cut off a limb or two, disabling the monsters and killing them quicker. Isaac does this with his engineering equipment. It makes perfect sense because Isaac is not a fighter, he is a fixer. All he has is the tools on hand and what he discovers on the Ishimura. Another fun aspect of Dead Space is its zero-G sections. The team at Redwood did extensive research to get the feel of space exploration bang on, famously strapping bungee cables to animation director Chris Stein's legs to simulate walking in zero-G. It goes without saying that death also plays a major part in Dead Space's core design, and given the sheer amount of ways Isaac could die, his model was given dozens of points where he could be torn apart and boy can he be ripped to pieces. Ouch. Right, now it's time for a brief rundown of the plot. You take on the role of Isaac Clarke, an engineer working for the CEC. Isaac and the rest of the USG Kellyan crew are dispatched by the CEC to investigate a distress signal from their flagship vessel, the Ishimura. When they arrive, the Ishimura looks all kinds of abandoned, and it's not long before nasty looking aliens appear and begin to rip and tear, literally. Isaac escapes the initial mayhem and then through the guidance of Zach Hammond and Kendra Daniels sets off to find his girlfriend and get them all out of this hellhole. Along the way, Isaac discovers the existence of the Marker, a giant alien artifact responsible for all the madness and a whole host of people who are after it. Oh, and of course, he gets into scrapes with lots of monsters. More details into Isaac's journey will be looked into later, but for now, let's take a deeper look at what the future looks like in Dead Space. It's the year 2508, and Earth is looking a little rough, having gone through an extinction-level event caused by the aggressively greedy and untenable use of its resources. Because humans are full of good ideas, the remaining humans in power decided to search for new planets and drain their resources. This is where the Concordance Extraction Corporation, aka the CEC, came in and basically saved humanity. The CEC were the industry leaders in deep space mining, being the largest solar mining and extraction company on Earth and the fifth largest company in market capital. They were big business to say the least. Their grand creation, the Planet Cracker class starship, would be what eventually staved off Earth's demise. The term planet cracking is basically as it sounds, a planet is literally cracked open to be mined for its resources. And here's how it works kids. Step 1. Extensively survey planets until you find one that's rich with resources. Step 2. Establish a colony in a ring shape around the designated area, roughly a kilometre across. Step 3. Use gravity tethers to keep everything in place while a piece of the planet is carved out. Step 4. The gravity tethers and planet cracker in orbit then break off the humongous piece of planet and bring it on board the ship in order to strip it and study its ore content. The USG Ishimura created in 2446 was the first planet cracker to be built and also the largest in the fleet. Its first successful mission was Titan, one of Saturn's moons. Reportedly, it was cracked until nearly nothing remained. What was left of the moon formed the basis of Titan Station. Planet cracking over the continuing years would prove fruitful for the citizens of Earth, with only a handful of actual disasters occurring. More notably, a mining operation on Wenat went to pot, losing a planet cracker, three supply ships, and the entire colony due to a gravity tether failure. Over the course of its service history, and by the time we reached the start of the game, the Ishimura had completed a grand total of 34 planet cracks over its 62 years in service. 
it went down in legend as the saviour of Earth. Its 35th crack, which was to take place on Aegis 7, was shrouded in shadiness on the count of it being an illegal mining operation, but more on that later. For now, we are going to take a quick look at the major part of Dead Space's future, the marker and the religion surrounding it, Unitology. According to the prequel novel Dead Space Martyr, the original Black Marker aka the Prime Marker was discovered in 2214 by Michael Altman and a team of researchers from Dredger Corp. On Earth in Chicxulub, just off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. According to research, the Marker crash landed on Earth roughly 65 million years ago and was responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs. The Marker was known to the locals as Tale of the Devil but never spoken about to outsiders. While anthropologist Ada Chavez was working in Chicxulub, she caught wind of this devil's tale and the strange rumours surrounding the town's folklore. It just so happens that she was the girlfriend of Michael Altman, who upon hearing this information, decided it was worth investigating. The book is quite the info dump, but provides some much needed context to the history of the marker, delving into its discovery and the accidental formation of unitology the religion centred around the markers. The funny thing is, no one actually knows the true purpose of the markers, although the general belief is that the inscriptions on the marker are a message that will reveal the true origin and meaning of human life. According to an in-game log, unitologists believe that the marker contained a code, the key to eternal life, through rebirth and ascension to heaven. I'm good thanks. What's worse is that Unitology spread quite quickly due to its positive messaging. It appeared at a time where humanity was teetering on the brink of self-destruction, so served as a beacon of hope for many. While Unitologists have never really clarified what their god is, whatever this higher intelligence is, it created the marker and is the driving force that's trying to regather humanity and make it one through the process of convergence. It's seen in game when you encounter Chalice Mercer, that he uses the term God quite often to refer to the power behind the marker and the events that are taking place. More on him later. You'll hear the term make us whole a lot throughout the Dead Space series and essentially that is what the convergence is to Unitologists. They would willingly commit suicide during necromorph outbreaks allowing their bodies to be taken over. True information about what a convergence really is isn't delved into until later in the series, so I'll save that for a later video. In short, the Unitologist religion is highly eschatological, laser focused on the end of days concept shared by other religions. Death is of course the main focus and the Unitologists believe that all living beings will intertwine in the manner of two prongs of the marker to become one vis-a-vis -vis the convergence. Having recovered the data on the Black Marker, the Sovereign Colonies, the predecessors to EarthGov, set about replicating the Black Marker, creating their own Red Markers. Yes, because this was a good idea, wasn't it? Upon activation, the Red Markers emit a highly tuned frequency that reanimates the cells of dead organic tissue upon contact. Why would you mess with this stuff? I <laughs> In destruction, and I do mean it would have to be completely obliterated, any necromorphs created would be turned into a nice sludgy mess, only reanimated once again in the presence of another marker. The signal, according to logs, also created a small dead space around the marker that caused the recombination effect to go dormant, preventing the creatures from touching the object. Living humans exposed to the frequency suffer from various effects, perceiving noises such as whispers, images which make no sense and more importantly, hallucinations which play a big part throughout the story. Because experimentation is fun, Red Marker 3A was placed on Aegis 7, somewhat 200 years before the start of the game. Shit went south and the site was eventually blacklisted in 2314, meaning no one could go there. In 2508, Red Marker 3A was discovered by an illegal mining colony courtesy of the CEC. When the colonists of Aegis 7 discovered the Red Marker, it started to do things to the inhabitants, causing insomnia, growing dementia and even vivid hallucinations of their loved ones. 
By the time the Ishimura arrived on the scene, the red marker had already been extracted and brought into the colony, with the unitologist believing it to be the same marker from the sacred texts. The effects only worsened, with suicide and murder rates skyrocketing. Captain of the Ishimura, Benjamin Matthias, ordered the red marker to be brought on board the Ishimura. Yeah, good idea, buddy. Of course, this decision was at the behest of the Church of Unitology, so it kind of makes sense. A week after the planet crack, there was a complete blackout from the colony and things really went to hell with all the super murder death culminating in a necromorph breakout. Colonists started to panic and left in droves on shuttles, fleeing to the safety of the Ishimura. One overloaded shuttle crashed into the shuttle bay, destroying all remaining shuttles and leaving everyone else stranded. The ones that made it off were fired upon by the Ishimura for violating the no-fly order put in place by the captain. Only two shuttles made it through, one piloted by dig foreman Colin Barrow, who crash-landed into the hangar bay, and the other was flown by Gabe Weller, which crash-landed on the hull near the crew deck. Barrow also happened to have his wife's corpse on board with him, which, yep, you've guessed it, was infected by a necromorph. The newly infected Barrow and his wife made their way to the morgue where more bodies were infected. Need I say more? While everything was going to hell on the Ishimura, the ship's security officer, Alyssa Vincent, took cover from the creatures at the base of Marker 3A, protected by its dead space. Of course, the Marker wanted more people to come to Aegis 7, so it used the vision of Alyssa's squadmate Ramirez to get her to send a distress call. A short time later, the USG Kellyan arrived at the Ishimura in response to the signal. And this, folks, is where the game begins. Although when you first fire it up, you know none of this and are more concerned with not being ripped to shreds by the lovely creatures. Speaking of which, let's take a look at them. Unlike the previous games I've covered, there's no symbolism when it comes to the enemies in Dead Space. That doesn't mean we can't take a look at the evil denizens present on the Ishimura. The word necromorph is made up of two Greek words which aptly describe what they are in essence. The word necro literally means death, while morph means form or shape. Morph is also a shortened version of metamorphosis, which means change of form or structure. So really, we are looking at the dead transformed, twisted by the markers. The extraterrestrial infection pulled from the skin of the markers is what causes corpses to mutate into necromorphs, with their sole purpose being to spread the infection to other bodies. Hence, the hyper-aggressive nature. The purpose of this is to eventually create something called a Brethren Moon. As the Brethren Moons do not appear till later in the series, I'll save information on the moons until then. Let's look at the first of the necromorphs, the Slasher. Slashers are your basic jobber enemy found throughout Dead Space. They are created from a single human corpse and are aptly named Slasher on the count of them dual-wielding bone blades which sprout from their hands. You'll notice Slashers also have a second pair of arms which come from their midsection. These limbs serve as a way to propel Slashers across the floor once you cut their legs off. Slashers' feet are also modified with an extended heel bone that aids balance. Despite this, they are still fairly unstable while walking, mostly due to the fact that they are windmilling in when gunning for Isaac. They also have quite the audio range for different situations. For instance, if they are just milling around, you'll hear them making their general gurgling and choking noises. They also do this while sneaking behind Isaac, so you have to be careful of that. When aggroed, their gurgling transforms into angry roars and lots of shouting. Audio cues are always handy to tell you how to handle the situation. There are a bunch of variations of the Slasher with slightly different audio cues and even a tougher version seen later in the game identified by its darker skin having undergone advanced decomposition. Next up we have the Leaper. As the name suggests, Leapers launch themselves towards their victims and try to impel them with their scorpion-like tails. Their tails are equipped with a long scythe and are made from the host's intestines and legs. Yum! The Leaper's upper body strength is more developed than the Slasher, on the count of them not having any legs to stand on. Their fingers have bladed claws for climbing and the hands have also become dislocated, creating animal-like paws. 
This, along with their ghastly mutated mouths and deadly tail, mean they have many angles of attack, especially excelling in zero-g environments, showing no signs of slowdown. Of course, the Leaper also has an enhanced variant as seen later in the game, sporting darker skin, glowing eyes and enhanced damage. The Lurker enemy type is generally created from cloned human infants making it one of the most disturbing enemy types in Dead Space. They also happen to be annoying assholes. It's hinted at by a radiography photograph in Dead Space that Lurkers can also be developed inside the womb of an unsuspecting mother, which is pretty horrible. They are quite mobile considering their body shape and have no problem sitting on walls or the ceiling in order to get hits on you with their ranged attacks. They carry coiled tentacles in their pelvic area, which can unfurl when they want to unleash hell, firing barbs at high speeds and incredible accuracy. They also use their tentacles to whip opponents at close range, so there really is no safe distance to engage, you just need to deal with them quickly. Looking at the lurker, there's not much of the human elements left, save the upper parts of the face and the dangling hands and feet. Their movement is provided by more tentacles which protrude from their lower abdomen. Like the Leaper, Lurkers also excel in zero-g, moving freely between surfaces and firing barbs from all angles. In a continuing theme, the Lurkers also have darker skin variants, making them more resilient to damage while outputting more damage themselves. Next up, we have the Infectors. These fun little guys go around, you guessed it, infecting corpses with proboscis and turning them into new necromorphs. You wouldn't think so when first looking at them, but they are formed from a human torso and legs. They have wings which are formed by a flap of skin from the chest and then fuse between the host's broken legs. The proboscis is made from mutated bone, muscle and spinal tissue and is the delivery system used to infect new hosts. You will see them do this by latching onto a new host, shrouding them in their wings and stabbing them right in the skull. The fact that any intact body you encounter is a potential host means you can't just walk around completely safe when navigating the Ishimura. I for one was extremely paranoid and decided to destroy everything just to be safe. But yes, taking out any corpses in the vicinity of an infector will make them attack you instead, but of course they are much easier to deal with than the slashes they make. As demonstrated by the wonderful Chalice Mercer, Infectors seem to have a preference for corpses with existing head wounds. What lazy gits. There is of course an enhanced version of the Infector which... I'm just going to stop mentioning these. You get the picture. Some radically mutated slashers end up developing large sacs on their torso, which upon being heavily damaged will claw at their sacs and unleash the smaller swarmer variant of the Necromorph family. Like the slashers, they still have their main form of attack in their slashing bone scythes. Their jaws have been detached and instead have smaller tentacles hanging down. In order to accommodate the weight, the pregnant's legs have become shorter and stubbier, keeping them better balanced but also making them move slightly slower. As mentioned a moment ago, near death, pregnants will rip themselves open to reveal their lovely children, who will then do their very best to avenge their parents' death by swarming Isaac and trying to eat him. Swarmers effectively look like green flappy bits of skin and stand around flailing their scummy flesh bits until a target is in sight. One or two on their own are not really an issue, but if you get a whole bunch at once then you can't mess around or they will drain you very quickly. Wait, there's no enhanced version of these? Yeah! Do you know what's annoying? Walking around minding your own business and then BAM! You get grabbed by a bloody rando tentacle. What's worse is that during these segments, Isaac has forgotten how to aim. Tentacles show up all over the place in Dead Space, either as their own entity or as part of a large necromorph such as the Leviathan or the Hivemind. The ones we're talking about here are the independent type. You know, they don't need no body and making their own living. That's right. Generally, tentacles spawn in areas with heavy corruption. The corruption, if you didn't know, is a habitat changer, as mentioned to Isaac by Kendrick Daniels. It acts as a biome for the necromorphs, making infestation a lot easier. It grows by absorbing organic matter around it, spreading extremely quickly and also apparently smelling like vomit. 
Thankfully, it doesn't absorb living tissue, which is why Isaac can still walk on it, even if it is a little slower. Anyway, back to the tentacles. They will appear in a few places during the campaign, either trying to drag Isaac to who knows where, or protecting the red marker. Despite being seemingly made from muscle tissue and bone, the tentacles are impervious to damage. The only way to damage them is the exposed bright yellow sac they all have. How convenient. Brutes are frightening to fight against. They are massive, encased in a spiked exoskeleton armour, made of bone and calcified skin, and they love to run at you with decent speed. Oh, and they are made of multiple human corpses. Lovely. Not only do they punch the crap out of you, but if you somehow manage to sever an arm or a leg, they will fire highly explosive organic material from their chest sacs. They have one weak spot and that's their back, which is only really accessible if you manage to put them in stasis and get behind them. Attacking from the front doesn't do much as bullets just ricochet off their armour. Hit them enough though and they will curl up into a ball, letting you get behind for some big damage. Oh, and uh, enhanced form. Guardians are grim, and dangerous, let's not forget that they are dangerous. They are created from a single human body that is fused with the corruption that's growing on the walls. Being anchored to the walls, they cannot actively go looking for Isaac, but so serve as guardians to areas of importance to the infestation, hence the name. Oddly, these creatures still maintain some human behaviour, wailing in agony from time to time. It makes you wonder if there's still anything left of the host inside. There are two types of guardian as well, a premature guardian with its body mostly intact from the waist up, then the fully matured guardian which is more of a globby mess, growing new appendages to keep it anchored to the wall. Their newly grown sacs produce pods, which if you've played Dead Space you know can be a pain in the ass. The pods look like fleshy lumps which when approached sprout tentacles that fire quills at Isaac. On their own, they're not much of a threat, but in a large group, can drain Isaac's health pretty quickly. Thanks to Dr Chalice Mercer, the Hunter becomes quite the consistent threat throughout Isaac's jaunt on the Ishimura. Chalice created the Hunter by inserting a piece of necrotic tissue obtained from the corruption directly into the cranium of an unknown crew member. This resulted in a much taller, bulkier slasher being created, with potent aggression and the ability to regenerate. As a result, this creature cannot be killed by just severing its limbs due to the fact they regenerate in seconds. It does however do really badly against incineration. GG's buddy. I do like the Hunter though. Constant threats that put you on edge are always welcome in horror games and the Hunter does this well, by taking what you've learned so far and completely stripping away your ability to deal with it in the usual manner. Despite having little presence in the game, I had to give a shout out to the Weezers. Eight poor humans got trapped in the hydroponics deck and got infected, developing large lungs on their backs. Aside from the large lungs, they look mostly human and don't attack anything when approached. They just sit there, minding their own business, spreading poisonous gas around. That's all. No context is really given as to why these eight developed differently, and to be honest, feel like they were just thrown in to suit the mechanics of that level as opposed to fitting any lore narrative. You could argue that as these necromorphs were discovered in the hydroponics deck, that their location could be the reason for their odd transformation. Hydroponics is a type of horticulture and a subset of hydroculture which involves growing plants and crops without soil using mineral nutrient solutions in an aqueous solvent. So maybe, just maybe, the original staff of the hydroponics deck were mutated along with the solvents, causing a weird mixture of the two. That's my theory and not explicitly confirmed by any source material, but it also makes the most sense. Also created from a single human host, the exploders are present for one reason, to blow up in your face. The host's cranium is split in twain, held loosely together by tissue, allowing the two halves to act as their jaws. Their bodies are fairly frail looking, despite being slightly more resilient to damage than their necro brothers. Their defining feature however is the large glowing pustules attached to their left arm. Despite their less than optimal appendages, they still manage to close distance quickly and if they get close will hit you causing their sack of yellow goo to explode for big damage. Naturally, the yellow substance is extremely volatile and one hit from any weapon is enough to make it explode and deal with the creature. Thankfully, 
Exploders are easily detectable due to the very distinct sounds they make when nearby, giving you plenty of time to react. High ranking officers aboard the Ishimura who were unlucky enough to become infected end up becoming diviners. Slightly resembling Slender Man, their limbs have become elongated, their fingers are fused together and become claws, and have the added bonus of owning long tongues. Spicy. Although their tongues are used mostly for strangling their victims, so don't get too excited. More interestingly, diviners get their name from the fact that once destroyed, their individual body parts become independent necromorphs, known as either components or divider spawn. The most dangerous part is the head, growing its own tentacle arms which is used to attach itself to its victims, strangling them if possible. The death animation for the head is particularly entertaining, as it rips Isaac's head off and replaces it with its own. Not to be confused with bird lovers, Twitches are marines who became infected and have merged with their stasis units. Oddly, the effects of the stasis units have become reversed, meaning instead of moving at snail pace, the Twitchers move ridiculously quick, making them an absolute terror for Isaac, getting up close quick and generally being hard to predict. It's hard to notice due to their erratic behaviour, but they move just like slashes and to an extent look like them too, only slightly bulkier. Another thing that's hard to notice is the fact Twitchers have mostly human faces, but are missing their eyes and have the tops of their skulls hollowed out and filled with tentacles. Nice. Damn it. The poison wasn't strong enough. It's still alive. Get in there and kill it before it contaminates the entire ship. Entering zero gravity. Next up, we have the first boss encountered in the game, the Leviathan. This ginormous amorphous monstrosity collides with the Ishimura while drifting through space. It finds its way into hydroponics and eventually sets up shop in the food storage facility. The Leviathan's arrival on that part of the ship sped at the rate of corruption in that area, taking over most of the deck. The guys tried to poison him, but after that proved ineffective, Isaac decided it's time to put its tools to work. The creature was named Leviathan by a random crew member who encountered it. Not quite sure how he lived to tell the tale, but here we are. Chances are, this naming convention was random. In modern Hebrew, the word Leviathan simply means whale, as in the rather large fish that swallowed Jonah from the Bible. It's a term synonymous with the sea monster, and even though there are no fish here, you can maybe see why someone would call a giant floating space monster a Leviathan. Certain esoteric and occult literature describes Leviathan as a gatekeeper of hell, so there's that as well. There's no real evidence to explain where the Leviathan actually came from. It's referenced in one log, where it crashes into the side of the ship, but there's nothing else. It's a mystery. Many have theorised that it was created on the surface of Ages 7 and ejected into space, being made up entirely of the colonists' biomass. But there's no evidence to support this. The Slug is another massive necromorph who just so happens to be blocking the blast doors of the Ishimura. This fight is a race against the clock, because Isaac and friends need that blast door open to get a warning message over to the USG Valor, letting them know that the escape pod they just received has a slasher on board. This boss is fought using one of the Ishimura's anti-asteroid cannons, ADS Cannon 48. It's a pretty simple affair of shooting the yellow bits and hitting the rocks. Despite blowing up the slug, Isaac was just a touch too slow. The necromorph got on board the Valor and murdered lots of people, including whoever must have been piloting the ship, because moments later it crashes into the Ishimura, causing lots of damage. Like the Leviathan, it's not really explained how the slug got on board or where it came from. Some have theorised that it's an offshoot of the spider boss from Dead Space Extraction, but there's no evidence to support this.
During the 2290s, research and military testing on Marker 3A led to the creation of the Hive Mind. After the marker was deemed too dangerous to be wielded as a weapon, it was abandoned on Aegis 7 above the Hive Mind's resting place, where it would remain dormant for 200 years. When the CEC's illegal mining team found the marker, it began slowly driving the members of the mining colony insane, thus beginning the Necromorph outbreak. When the Ishimura arrived and extracted a large portion of the planet, the hive mine was exposed and its influence grew stronger. The marker's presence had also been keeping the hive mine dormant, so when it was removed, the creature woke and began its killing spree. Before long, the colony was overrun, followed by the Ishimura. Of course, Isaac has to take this beast on, but we'll look into the circumstances surrounding that moment and the aftermath a little later. For now, Let's look at the main players in Dead Space. Zach Hammond is the Chief Security Officer of the USG Kellyan and in charge of the operation to assist the Ishimura during its time of peril. Generally, Hammond is dedicated to the cause, always putting the mission first. Despite the Necromorph outbreak, Hammond is determined to complete the mission, firstly making his way to the bridge to assist Isaac in restoring the Ishimura systems and ADS. Hammond is more than capable of handling himself, dispatching several necromorphs, including one he jettisoned inside an escape pod, although considering past events, that might not be the best idea. A little later, Hammond is incapacitated and loses contact with Isaac. During this time, another CEC ship, the Valor, is dispatched to retrieve the marker from the Ishimura. Unfortunately, hindsight is a bitch, and that jettisoned escape pod containing the necromorph found its way onto the Valor, making light work of its crew. Shortly after, the Valor crashes into the Ishimura. It's this event that causes Hammond to reevaluate his priorities, deciding to screw the mission and get his crew out of there. He re-establishes contact with Isaac and Kendra and advises them of an executive shuttle that he came across on the crew deck. It's at this point that Kendra tries to plant seeds of doubt regarding Hammond's loyalty, but she couldn't be further from the truth. This tactic, of course, was just a deflection from Kendra, who we will look at shortly. He makes his way to the Valor, discovers that the ship was not just passing by and was indeed prepared for war. He rendezvous with Isaac in the engine room and unfortunately meets a grisly end at the hands of an enhanced brute, which uses his corpse as a hammer to try and beat Isaac. Poor Hammond. He was a good guy in the end. Hammond is voiced by actor Peter Menser providing his likeness also. You'll recognise Peter from his roles in Spartacus, 300, and Jason X, where he played a similar role to Hammond, an elite security officer who sacrifices himself to allow the main protagonist to survive. Next up, we have the sneaky Kendra Daniels, who turns out is a bit of a dick. Persistent recommendations from higher-ups in the CEC pushed Kendra to serve aboard the Kellyan. Hammond requested some background information on the new recruit, and no information was given. I don't know about you, but this would have raised some red flags immediately. After the first attack on the Ishimura, Kendra spends the best part of the early game with Hammond, guiding Isaac through the Ishimura until they are attacked by a Leaper and subsequently separated. After getting to safety, Kendra continues to support Isaac and Hammond, overriding doors throughout the ship as well as discovering more information about the infestation. As mentioned earlier, she tried on a few occasions to influence Isaac against Hammond, suspecting he knew more about the marker than he was letting on. This of course was all deflection. According to Kendra, she also started to hallucinate, saying that she could see her brother on the monitor, waving at her. It's not confirmed, but my theory is that this could have been a lie, as a weird way to earn some trust. You know, that we're in this together mentality. A little later, after Isaac recovers the marker from the cargo bay and makes his way to meet Kine, Kendra intercepts and shoots Kine from somewhere. Like, like seriously, where the fuck is she? This confused me the first time I ever played this, so let's slow that down from another angle. Over here! Hurry! There's no time to waste, we must do it! <laughs> it's a blink and you'll miss it moment. Anyway, as Kendra flies off, she reveals her true mission, to recover the marker before bidding farewell to Isaac. 
She didn't get very far though, as Isaac recalled the shuttle back. Instead of going back to the Ishimura, she climbed onto an escape pod and crash landed near the infested colony on Aegis 7. Kendra then lay in wait for the perfect moment, trapping Isaac in the facility while she acquired the marker. Kendra also reveals a shocking if not predictable truth to Isaac, the fact that Nicole has been dead all along, meaning Isaac has been hallucinating this whole time. She says her goodbyes for a second time and prepares to load the marker onto a shuttle. Before she can however, the hive mind rises up and lays the smack down, fatally injuring her. She tries to get up, but a second tentacle strike crushes her, finishing her off for good. Dick. Kendra is voiced by Tanansin Carmelo, who also provides the likeness too. You may recognise Tanansin from Steven Spielberg's Into the West and from Imprint, amongst other things. Before his stint doing naughty things, Chalice Mercer was a dedicated member of the Ishimura crew, despite being a part of the Church of Unitology. During the initial Necromorph outbreak, Mercer's mind fractured and he decided to aid the Necromorphs in their takeover. He believed they were sent by God to destroy humanity. Mercer and Captain Matthias believed that the Red Marker was a holy artifact, while Dr Kine wanted the Marker off the ship. While Kine worked on a way to end the infestation, Mercer was actively experimenting on live crew members to create stronger necromorphs. Altogether folks, what an absolute dick! His experiments resulted in the creation of the Hunter, with live subjects seemingly giving regenerative properties to the beast. As evident from the decapitated heads in the office, it was seen that he attacked and killed many crew members in his search for the perfect necromorph. In game, Isaac doesn't encounter Mercer until Chapter 5, who tries to stop him from killing the Leviathan. He gives a big speech about how necromorphs are the salvation of mankind before releasing the hunter upon him. Cheers, buddy. He is again seen later, trying to convince Isaac to give up, locking the door once again during a necromorph attack. This seems to be his favourite trick, because he does it yet again in the cryogenics lab, setting the hunter on Isaac once more. After Isaac freezes the hunter, he goes off to fight the Leviathan. While that's happening, Mercer unfreezes his creation. Mercer is then not seen until Chapter 10, where he murders Jacob Temple shortly after murdering Elizabeth Cross, once again putting holes in their foreheads ready for a necromorph takeover. After taking care of the hunter, Mercer finally gives himself over to the necromorphs and let himself be killed by an infector. After this, he will become an enhanced slasher unless you're quick enough to kill the infector first. Naveed Negaban provides the voice and likeness for Chalice Mercer. You'll recognise Naveed from shows such as Homeland and Legion, and more recently in the live action version of Aladdin playing the Sultan. Terence Kine was a high ranking unitologist who became an expert on the Black Marker. This knowledge is what got him selected to serve as the Chief Science Officer aboard the Ishimura, helping Captain Benjamin Matthias retrieve Marker 3A from Aegis 7. Initially, Kain was super on board with his assignment, but as soon as he saw what the Marker's discovery did to the colony, he started to have his doubts about the church and his mission, opting to try and help the colonists as opposed to the other unitologists who, well, were not interested in helping. Evil bastards. Kain suggested that the Marker should not be brought aboard the ship until they could determine its nature. Of course, Matthias didn't listen, and when he started talking about bringing the marker to Earth, Kine declared him unfit for duty. Kine attempted to have Matthias arrested, and with the help of two crew members, tried to administer a sedative to ensure the captain wouldn't hurt himself or anyone else. By Maritime Law Article 5469, I hereby declare Captain Benjamin Matthias unfit for duty. The marker must be delivered to the church! Terence, please! I'm sorry, Ben, but I can't let you do this. Traitor! Heretic! Hold his head. Murderer! Hold him! He's dead. No, it was an accident. I, I had to stop him. Arrest the doctor. Now, 
The next details are a little sketchy, but somehow he pierced the captain's ocular cavity with a needle, straight up killing him. The crew tried to arrest Kine, but he managed to escape. At this point, Kine was convinced he needed to destroy the ship so the infection could not spread. With that, he set out to disable the guidance computers for the Ishimura and was thwarted by Chief Alessa Vincent of PCSI security. Still, he managed to disable the gravity centrifuge, the fuel lines and damage the propulsion and navigation systems of the executive shuttle. Had he gotten further with his plans, we might not have the game Dead Space. The marker played defence and induced hallucinations in Kine's mind. Hallucinations of his dead wife Amelia. She somehow convinced him that the hive mind could be contained if the marker was brought home to its pedestal on Ages 7. Unfortunately, due to his previous sabotage, this wasn't possible. Eventually, the Kellyan arrived and Isaac caught Kine's eye, because, you know, he's an engineer and he can fix things. After observing Isaac's journey, Kine eventually contacted him and asked him to help fix the shuttle and return the marker, subsequently holding the shuttle hostage until he retrieved the navigation cards for him. The two met. Kine confessed to Isaac that it was he who sabotaged the ship, also showing Isaac a video of the hive mind. After the repairs were done, Kine transported the shuttle to the cargo bay and got ready to launch while Isaac loaded the marker aboard. As the two were due to meet, Kine was shot in the chest from a weird angle, and that was that. Cheers, Kendra. Kine, in the end, had good intentions, but could still not do anything against the will of the marker. Sad times. Unlike Mercer, who expressed extreme zealot-like tendencies, Kine was the polar opposite, eventually turning away from unitology. Kine was voiced by Keith Zarabiker, who you'll recognise from other games such as L.A. Noir as Herschel Biggs, Dawn of War 2 Chaos Rising as Captain Apollo Diomedes, and Mass Effect 2 as the Harbinger. Next up, we're going to talk about Nicole Brennan, Isaac's girlfriend and senior medical officer on the Ishimura. A lot of Nicole's backstory is fleshed out in Dead Space Extraction, the game and the comic, both serving as a prequel to Dead Space. Initially, Nicole wasn't sure she was going to take the post aboard the Ishimura, but after some convincing from Isaac, she went for it. Not long after arriving on the Ishimura, Nicole and Dr. Kine conversed about the story circulating Aegis 7. Nicole planted her feet, stating that the Unitologists were religious zealots, and also discussing their link to the Union Square mass suicide. Kine didn't take this too well. On the day of the planet crack, Nicole and her colleague Perry dealt with the sick crewmen aboard the Ishimura. Despite thinking that they were completely boned even with a no-fly order in place, she told Perry that everything would be alright and the no-fly order would definitely help. Not long after that, things started to go south. The ship lost communications with the planet, there was a small outbreak on the crew deck, and there were more wounded on the flight deck that needed help. To further add to the chaos, PCSI security officer Alessa Vincent turned up and mentioned that they arrested four colonists who snuck aboard the ship and wanted them checked for signs of infection. Nicole quickly spotted the odd brain activity and blood pressure in Lexine Weller. As she started to release them one by one, a quarantine lockdown was triggered. Shortly after that lockdown was lifted, Nicole accompanied the survivors to the morgue. There, she discovered Kind's handiwork, a very dead, Captain Benjamin Matthias. From here, it was hell on Earth. Well, actually in space. As Nicole and friends struggled for survival. Much later in Sickbay 2, Nicole woke up to a necromorph attack. They sealed the room off, but it would be long before they broke through. With her final hours ahead of her, she recorded a video log message and sent it to Isaac, before committing suicide via an air embolism with an empty syringe to avoid being transformed by necromorphs. Now, that means that every instance you see of Nicole in the game is all in Isaac's head. It was really the marker all along, pushing Isaac to make them whole again and get the marker back to Aegis 7. Finally, it's time to talk about main lad Isaac Clarke. We've covered a lot of his journey so far, so now I'll take this opportunity to briefly go over a little Isaac history. After you finish the game, you get a text log explaining Isaac's origins. 
He was born on the 5th of June 2465 to parents Paul and Octavia. Paul was a ship designer and Octavia was a unitologist in the northeastern American seaboard sector. As a child, he spent most of his time with his mother due to his father being frequently away on missions. Due to this, he never really got to know him. Like his father, Isaac eventually partook in electrical and mechanical engineering. He got selected to attend a prominent engineering academy but was unable to afford the tuition fees as his mother had squandered the family funds on the Church of Unitology. As a result, Isaac grew to hate the church. Despite his money woes, Isaac graduated with high honours from a lesser college by becoming a ship systems engineer. Years later, he proved himself to his superiors by signing up for the Merchant Marines Division and absolutely bossed it. They were so impressed, they promoted him to a position closer to the major shipping lanes and at some point after that worked on the Ishimura. As a side note, Isaac was living with Nicole for a while before his career stagnated and Nicole got her post aboard the Ishimura. Isaac would not set foot on the Ishimura again until 2508, where a distress signal would be sent out and Isaac volunteered to be part of the rescue team. The rest is history. As I said earlier, there's not much more to go on if we are just looking at Isaac in the confines of dead space and any materials covering pre-game moments. Isaac is meant to be a blank slate that the player can imprint themselves on. Whether this is intentional is unknown, but the argument is pretty compelling. The fact that you don't see his face for the whole game further solidifies the theory, only being revealed when the game is over. Finally, here is a random factoid you may not have known. Isaac's full name, Isaac Clarke, is a homage to famous science fiction writers Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. Unlike other games I've covered so far, there's no ambiguity to Dead Space's ending. Isaac looks up to see the extracted rock hurtling towards the planet's surface before making a bolt for the shuttle. Isaac escapes just in time to watch the giant rock hit Aegis 7, ravaging the planet's surface and making it unstable. Isaac then takes a moment, removes his mask and plays Nicole's video one more time. After stopping the video, Isaac stares into space and moments later is seemingly attacked by a demonic creature resembling Nicole. At the time, there may have been some questions as to what that last moment meant, but as we discover later in the series, the events of Dead Space really took their toll on Isaac's mental health, later being diagnosed with dementia and post-traumatic stress disorder. Here, Nicole is clearly a violent hallucination brought on by his experiences and the contact with the marker. Right, it's that time once again to look at some quick fire numbers. Dead Space on PS3 has an average critic review of 88% on Metacritic, rating slightly higher on Xbox 360 with an average score of 89%. The overall PC Metacritic score comes in at a lower 86%. One of the best reviews came from Game Informer, giving it a massive 93%. The average user score on Metacritic across all three platforms is a decent 8.6. As I mentioned earlier, Dead Space was well loved and injected actual horror back into the horror genre and is evident in these scores. In its first week of release, Dead Space recorded sales of 193,000 units in North America, reaching 10th place in sales and the only new IP to enter the top 10 at the time. While very low at first, by December, that number grew to 421,000 units across all platforms, and by February 2009, had sold over 1 million units worldwide. As of June 2010, Dead Space had sold over 2 million copies. Despite being considered a commercial disappointment to EA upon release, Dead Space was still met with critical acclaim winning and being nominated for multiple industry awards and has been ranked by journalists as one of the greatest video games ever made. Overall, Dead Space is a massive success story. So much, in fact, that a remake is currently in the works over at EA's Motive Studios. Even though there's no plans to change the story or characters, it will be interesting to see what's different, especially as they are planning to include cut content from the original game. The remake is set to release sometime in 2023. 
At time of recording, Dead Space has been completed on PC by Rampancy in a speedy 1 hour, 8 minutes and 7 seconds. That's bloody quick! The console record is on Xbox 360 by Fiery, coming in at 1 hour, 56 minutes and 49 seconds. Links to both these runs, if you're interested, will be in the description. Right, that's it for the fourth episode of Deep Dives. If you like what you've watched today, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and also like this video. As always, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's been watching Deep Dives, everyone that's subbed to the channel, and also a big thank you for all the support, comments and general feedback. You are all fantastic. Please keep the comments and feedback coming. What have I done right? What have I done wrong? And did I miss anything? Finally, please follow me on Twitter at DonPedroX for regular updates on upcoming videos. If you like what I do and fancy supporting me, I have a Patreon. There's a link in the description of this video. You can go on there, choose a reward tier and get one of the benefits on offer. More tiers will be added over time. Finally, always remember, do your fucking research. Right. See you next time.